Hello, everyone. This is Trisha Ramsey. And on behalf of Virtuoso and 451 Research, which is now a part of S&P Global Market Intelligence, I would like to welcome you and say thank you for attending today's webcast titled Evolution and Transformation in the Managed Infrastructure and Alternative Cloud Market. Leading off today's discussion will be Liam Eagle, who is Research Director at 451 Research. Liam is also the head of Voice of the Enterprise and Voice of the Service Provider at 451. Joining Liam will be Charles Leguer, who is Senior Director of Global Marketing at Virtuoso. And joining us again will be Anna Severica, who is Director of Engineering at Virtuoso. Just a few quick housekeeping items before we get started. To ask a question, simply type it in the question box on your screen. We will get to as many as we can during the Q&A session. The presentation slides are available for download in the resources section in the console. And finally, the on-demand version of the webinar will be available for download once the live webcast concludes. And with that, I will turn it over to Liam. All right, thanks, Tricia. Um, and hi, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lee Eagle, as, uh, as she said, and, and, and uh, I'm a director, uh, a research director at 451 Research. Uh, I'm going to be starting today's session out with a sort of a conceptual look at the idea of an alternative cloud service, what matters to customers when they're considering alternative clouds, how do they identify and evaluate it, who is it for. And I'll be looking at it mostly from the perspective of service providers that might be developing or offering such a service and offering some insight on how they might think about how they're building building or going to market with that. Uh, just a, a quick note about myself. So as I said, I'm research director at 451. I'm a contributor to our cloud and managed services transformation channel coverage. I also lead our voice of the enterprise and our voice of the service provider survey research practices. So my session today is going to draw on both of these sort of areas of our research, our coverage of the evolving managed infrastructure services and cloud market, as well as our surveys of end users and what they're looking for from IT services, including cloud. Uh, so let me quickly review what I'll be covering today. So I'm going to start with some context, looking at the cloud market overall, and then we'll look at what exactly we mean by alternative cloud. We'll review some of the key components of the value proposition for this type of service. We'll look at uh, what kinds of customer it is best suited to serve. Um, we'll talk about uh, where to look for those customers and that future opportunity. Then we're going to wrap things up with a quick review, and we'll pass things over to our friends at Virtuoso. So before we get to the alternatives that are sort of the focus of the session today, I wanted to begin with the context that would create the appetite for an alternative in the first place. So the, the context, of course, is that the public cloud market is a market that is overwhelmingly dominated by a handful of hyperscale vendors. So depending on how you want to define hyperscalers or who you want to consider to be hyperscalers, uh, you know, there are maybe five, maybe six companies. We all, we, we all know that there's sort of Amazon Web Services, there's Microsoft Azure, there's Google Cloud Platform, and then some combination of you know, IBM or Oracle or Alibaba or other clouds that you might want to include in there. Um, the, the definition of high, hyperscaler roughly, uh, you know, roughly mapping to the, the enormous scale that they present in this market. So this is from our market monitor service, which is our market sizing and forecasting instrument. We estimate, uh, and, and, and mind you, this is just the infrastructure as a service market to have been a $28 billion market in 2020. Uh, however, the large largest five vendors account for about 75% of that revenue. And just to be clear here, again, we're focusing specifically on the part of the public cloud that is compute, and storage, and networking services. It excludes that larger universe of advanced services and advanced applications. Um, the consequence of this is that a handful of very large vendors dominate not only the 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 revenue in the market share, but they dominate the conversation. They define the expectations for the market uh, with their services and which, with their approaches. So, you know, from my perspective as an analyst or as a researcher, you know, we run the risk of not paying attention to other companies that may be succeeding or may be innovating in the space, maybe creating interesting alternatives to the hyperscalers. And this is a challenge that customers face as well when they're thinking about cloud. They're probably going to start out thinking about the cloud as described by the hyperscalers, as brought to market by the hyperscalers, even if that's not really, you know, this, the type of service that's the best fit for their business. 
Um, so let's look at, you know, as we begin to think about defining the alternative, I think it's really interesting to, to start with thinking about, you know, why are we bothering to define this? Or why are we bothering to sort of be clear about what we mean by alternative cloud? And, and, and you know, it's, it's sort of tempting to define the alternative according to what it is not, which is, you know, one of that handful of hyperscale public cloud providers. But of course, you know, while this is technically true, it really fails to capture the, uh, that the fact that a business that's looking for an alternative to hyperscalers is, is, is likely to be looking for a credible alternative to public cloud. So, uh, or already rather a credible alternative public cloud platform. So if we don't sort of look at that sort of, you know, facet of it, we're really making a distinction that includes almost everything out there in the market, right? Including hundreds or even thousands of other service providers worldwide. And that really isn't much of a distinction at all. So, you know, what we should really be focused on is setting a, a technical or operational bar uh, that a vendor has to clear in order to be considered a credible alternative to public cloud. And that sort of services the customer and that kind of services the service provider in terms of helping to understand how this def how and where this definition would apply. Obviously, the requirements for an individual customer are going to vary, uh, but hopefully the basics will be universal enough that something that's something we can apply across the sort sort of whole task of identifying the alternatives. So let's start putting together you know, a, a sense for how we define a credible alternative. So I should be clear here that 451 Research, we haven't really developed a formal definition for alternative cloud uh, for, for a few reasons, but right now we kind of treat this alternative cloud more as a topic area or, you know, sort of an informal idea than a formal market category. And and I think, you know, that that's the, the, one of the major reasons we haven't sort of you know, put, put forth this sort of very clear definition is that, you know, it's, it's still ill-defined and, and for us to sort of, um, it, what we don't want to do is necessarily, you know, present it as something that we can capture with, with a, a really finite number. Um, however, it's something that we've been giving more coverage to and more thought to from an analytical perspective. And of course, it's it's really helpful to know what we're talking about. So, just in terms of how would we, you know, separate somebody out as one of these these sort of alternatives as being part of this alternative discussion, the first thing is the sort of core cloud functions, right? Basically, the service needs to meet the definition for a cloud. It needs to be able to deliver distinct compute storage resources. It needs to have a few other, you know, key functions such as load balancing and DNS. Um, you know, it should be programmatically driven. So it should have ABIs, APIs for provisioning and APIs for operation. Um, the service should be built on a sort of quality of infrastructure and hardware that is comparable to the leading cloud providers. Um, it should have, uh, and this this is actually isn't really spelled out explicitly on this slide, but it should have SLAs that are comparable with the leading clouds, right? Uh, it should have a footprint that makes it more than just a uh, super regional offering, uh, unless that is, you know, uh, uh, you know, an explicit part of the value proposition of that particular offering. So it, I might phrase that more as it must satisfy the regional requirements of the customer, right? Um, and, and, and more often than not, that's going to mean it has a sort of a bit of a distributed footprint. Uh, it, it's going to need to comply with the standard regulatory and security requirements that a customer would would generally expect from a public cloud platform. Now, this isn't necessarily an exhaustive list, and in fact, I would expect that this bar will continue to rise over time as specific additional services or capabilities become more popular to the point of being kind of table, sk table stakes for our cloud platform. But I think it gives you a good sense for how we can narrow the lens down to a subset of that larger group of hundreds or thousands to the point where we're talking about, you know, tens or dozens of service providers that fit this bill of being part of the, the map of alternatives. So let's start to look at the question of who and what is this sort of alternative cloud for, right? And I think a really important and central part of that concept is the idea that the benefits of an alternative cloud are the benefits of cloud. That is, at its core, you're getting the benefits from these services that you would expect to receive from any cloud, whether it's the hyperscaler or whether it's otherwise. <clears throat> And in our surveys and in our conversations with businesses, including both, you know, really large organizations and SMBs, we hear pretty consistently that the benefits that they expect from cloud are very similar. Generally, it is some combination of agility, performance, availability, cost, and security. 
the order of those or the priority of those may vary depending on the sort of you know unique requirements of the business in question but generally speaking they're they're from that list and and, and so the the expectation is the same for these alternatives or the or the intended outcomes remain the same uh, even if the sort of precise path to these outcomes may be different uh, but i think it's an important point to to understand that at the core the benefits of this alternative cloud are not different from the benefits of the cloud in general. The benefits of the alternative cloud are the benefits of the cloud uh, framed in a slightly different package. And, and so from there, we can begin to look for areas in which the alternatives may actually offer something different. So in a very general sense, I think there are two main categories of benefits that the alternatives offer to the hyperscalers specifically. So the first is kind of, you could think of it as kind of addition by subtraction. So a move toward simplicity. In general, uh, alternatives tend, the, the, the alternatives or the, the, the most prominent organizations that we tend to think of as alternative clouds tend to put simplicity forward as part of their value proposition, as a really core part of their value proposition. Uh, and this may be in terms of the simplicity of the interface or simplicity of the offering itself or simplicity of the pricing structure or the method of billing or even uh, the price itself. Uh, you know, and, and just all of that lending itself toward this overall sense of ease of use being one of the priorities uh, for users. This can also be reflected in kind of a, think of it as a softer learning curve. So a reduction in the time from starting out working on a platform to being able to accomplish what you want to do with it. And so, and so all of that, I think, would sort of fall into that simplicity or that uh, addition by subtraction category. And then the I guess there are examples where, um, you know, the alternatives may offer more than the bigger uh, sort of leading cloud providers would offer in terms of capabilities. And the most, the most common or likely examples of that are going to be examples where the provider bundles in a higher level of management or of customer support along with the infrastructure, right? That kind of uh, hands-on support or management isn't really how the hyperscalers off operate unless you're a truly huge customer. Uh, and this can definitely be... Um, a differentiator for the kinds of customers that would benefit from an alternative cloud. So let's talk a bit more about those customers. So in thinking about the kind of organization that might benefit most from alternative cloud, let's, you know, let's continue to think of simplicity as a benefit, right? So as a baseline, I would say that most companies that are developing or operating an application, so anybody that has an application to run somewhere, would stand to benefit from cloud uh, in general. However, you know, we are consistently seeing that access to the skill sets that are necessary to execute effectively has become a really key roadblock or hurdle to a lot of organizations make, uh, you know, making these investments or successfully executing on public cloud. And that is made more intense by the fact that, you know, the hyperscalers tend to hold the pace of innovation so the rate at which they introduce new you know service features or offerings as a key part of their value so for instance if you're a company that is trying to run something on a hyperscale public cloud part of the part of the job of you know being expert in that platform is keeping up with an incredible pace of new features and functions so a company would benefit if it understands the potential benefits of using a cloud platform, and as we talked about before, that's a lot of you know agility, performance, availability, scalability, uh, you know price, security, uh, but doesn't have the expertise or the desire necessary to overcome the engineering or, or the skill set challenge that that sort of you know leads to those outcomes, uh, or just simply doesn't have the desire to work with the most complicated tools available. So the business that will benefit most from the alternatives are the ones that will actually appreciate the simplicity of the platforms. These are frequently going to be SMBs or small businesses, but it is not exclusively SMBs and small businesses or sort of like independent developers that, uh, that would stand to benefit from the alternative. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about how the alternatives might fit into a bigger sort of portfolio of cloud services. So the, the term alternative kind of suggests that we're talking about instead of. However, I, I think that this sort of alternative cloud premise can also be a complementary piece for a more diverse portfolio. So in our survey research, we see more and more organizations telling us that um, 
you know, their organizing principle for operating IT going forward is a sort of hybrid cloud model, right? Which means that they're using things on premises. It means that they're using public cloud services. They're using some other things that might be in some other hosted types of environments like private cloud. Um, and in fact, many more of them, sorry, more and more, many of them are telling us that you know, when they're when they're working with public cloud, they're working with multiple different public cloud vendors, and that is by design. Um, and 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 as you can see here, it's for a variety of reasons uh, that includes access to key features of the various platforms on a case by case basis, as sort of the primary reason for working with multiple different vendors. So, for all those reasons we discussed before, cost, simplicity, ease of use, and the idea that each of those things may be a sort of uh, you know, vendor specific capability when it comes to the alternative clouds, there may be a role for the alternatives to play in that larger cloud portfolio of a company that has a multi cloud approach to consuming cloud resources. So, you know, this may be, you know, useful for an application that benefits from a straightforward platform. Uh, it may be useful for uh, delivering resources to groups within a larger organization that don't necessarily have, you know, the skills in their team to to work with the types of resources that are available from hyperscaler. Uh, but there, I think there are, you know, multiple different reasons why alternatives could make their way into the portfolio of a company that's working with multiple different platforms. Um, so we expect the overall cloud market to keep growing, but a big part of that growth is driven by hyperscalers making big investments in helping companies to migrate workloads from on-premises environments into their clouds. So, what I expect from that is is the the general effect of that on the so that drives the growth of the market. It also dry, it also tips the balance or continues to tip the balance in favor of that portion of the market that's served by the hyperscalers from a purely revenue standpoint. However, you know the alternatives aren't necessarily you know, even though they're not competing necessarily for the same workloads in the same way as the hyperscalers. Um, you know they also strategically you know the, the the ones that we talk to aren't you know content to fight over the scraps they're not thinking of this in terms of you know oh how can i go take you know a uh, million dollars in revenue from another hyperscaler they're really thinking about what other parts of the market can we capture what can what can lead to the growth of the portion of the market that's best served by the alternatives and there are a few ways in which new business will come to these alternative clouds the first of those is subscribers of existing services adding these offerings to what they're buying from existing vendors. So this refers particularly to cases where this alternative cloud is one component of a larger portfolio of services delivered by, say, a telco provider or a data center operator or a managed infrastructure provider that mostly focuses on private cloud or that mostly focuses on some kind of other managed hosting type of environment. Um, some of these sort of alternative vendors also believe there's an opportunity to capture some of that business that is migrated from internal systems into these hyperscale clouds, where those businesses, uh, you know, because there has been this sort of, uh, you know, this sort of widespread push to cloud, uh, and, and, and some of those businesses are beginning to recognize that maybe they're oversubscribed, maybe they're buying more from these public clouds than they, than they really need to use. Uh, and so they may see a significant financial benefit in shifting to a simpler alternative. And then finally, there is a strong sense, especially among those alternatives that offer, you know, something like a bare metal component to their solution that excuse me, that there, you know, this is a also a strong replacement for, uh, you know, a re something that's running in retail collocation in, in some cases where, again, in a similar kind of, you know, similar kind of calculus, uh, a customer finds that they're really paying more than they need in order to operate a particular application or a particular workload or a particular set of applications. So, I guess, I guess we can conclude my part here by, you know, let's recap some, some of the sort of key points about the sessions of context. Cloud is a market that's dominated by a handful of hyperscalers in terms of market share, but also in terms of what people are really expecting from a cloud service. Uh, so defining the alternative is, is, is a matter of creating a bar for capability that services must clear in order to be considered a credible alternative for somebody who's considering cloud. Um, I wanted to highlight the value of simplicity. It's a matter of taking complexity out of the system, as well as bundling back in some valuable capabilities. Um, in terms of who benefits from this, it's just about anybody with an application uh, 
that they need to operate can benefit from the cloud, but not everybody has the skills that they're, they're required to benefit the most from a really highly complex cloud platform. Uh, and then, you know, customers are going to come from existing subscribers of different services. They're potentially going to come from businesses to which the sort of alternative cloud providers can communicate uh, of value relative to what they're doing now, uh, whether that's a bigger cloud or some other kind of environment. Uh, and with that, I'm going to hand things over to Charles from Virtuoso. Thank you, Liam. Uh, most interesting indeed. Um, first of all, uh, thank you to your listeners out there, to our listeners. Um, I guess in response, I believe Virtuos is well in its way to providing an alternative cloud. And I hope that the concepts we're talking about today resonate with our listeners and provides a look at what the alternative may look like. So I guess the place to start is what, who is Virtuosa? So let me start off by saying and positioning our organization. Virtuoso first developed our own commercially available container technology about 20 years ago and has been successful in commercializing our offerings where we specialize in virtualization, software-defined storage, hyper-convergence, and hybrid cloud. We continue to innovate in areas ranging from industry-leading virtualized object storage to cloud-optimized Linux distributions to ground-baking container migration technologies. One area that I believe we excel at and I'm proud of is providing hosting organizations with underlying technology that enables web hosting and VPS, or, or rather virtual private servers. Virtualizer currently sits with approximately 35% of the segment globally. While this may not be growing at speed of cloud, we believe it plays such an important role in getting organizations prepared for the digital evolution or I guess revolution, depending on how you look at it. The one thing we have seen through the pandemic is the speed at which organizations require more than just shared hosting and are starting to move to virtual private servers as their needs grow and they accelerate digitally. Our innovative technology allows us to provide the highest ROI for hosters. And this is due to our density our software can achieve on our partner's hardware. I believe it rivals even the most cost-effective cloud solutions out there. I must stress this is not possible without our commitment to the open source community and, and vice versa. Virtuos is currently the fourth highest contributor globally to open source emulators like QEMU and virtualizers such as KVM. We have a vast global footprint that spans the entire globe and are growing aggressively at approximately 120, approximately 20% 20 a year. We currently have over 130 employees located at 16 different locations, covering all the territories we operate in, which are the Americas, both North and South, Europe, Middle East, and Africa, EMEA, as well as Asia Pacific. We are proud of our revenue growth of 23% annually, and even more excited about our partner acquisition which is approximately at 50% 50% on an average across our existing product sets. We will discuss our product sets a little further in, into the presentation. Um, but I guess when we look at our hybrid server, which is growing um, and servicing the uh, hosting market, we're growing at just over 13% annually. And our virtual is a hybrid infrastructure, which is servicing the MSP market and CSP market, at approximately 80% yearly. This is testament to where the market's going, and there is room for high growth in the existing market while competing against similar infrastructure providers. Our team is actively innovating, and we have over 100 patents for our core technologies with over 150 applications that have been filed. Most importantly, we have over 450 active partners ranging from some of the largest hosters in the world to telcos, distributors, independent software vendors, managed service providers, and CSPs. The important aspect to note here is that most of our contracts have been re-signed multiple times for extended periods. And in some cases, we are in their, we are in their fourth or fifth iteration of these. I believe this indicates the types of relationships 
we have with our partners. We are constantly adding value and working with them to define new opportunities and growing together, something we pride ourselves on. If we look at the last 20 years, one area that we cannot stress enough is the importance of our collaboration with our partners and the open source community. And I can't think of a better person to talk about this than Anna Savrinko. But before Anna speaks, I wanted to give you a brief background. Anna has been with Virtualizer for 16 years and is our Director of Engineering. She has been leading our company's team at, with cutting edge technology and co-creates the future of container virtualization, virtual machines, software-defined storage, and workload management. This is grounded by her certification she achieved from the Moscow Institute of Physics and Technology, which I might add she received honors. To complement the computer science, Anna has attended world-class leadership programs from Harvard Business School. With that, Anna, please can you take us through our history of open source communities and our products your team has engineered, and finally, the new world we see, which is our hybrid cloud concept. Anna, over to you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, I would like to start by explaining who we are from a technology point of view. One of the key things in Virtuoso's DNA is our tight collaboration with open source communities. I think you would agree that nowadays, to stay up to speed with the latest technologies, one has to leverage the power of open source. Virtuoso does rely on open source components but we also actively contribute back to the communities. Thus, we co-create the future of containers and virtual machines, which is a base for virtual infrastructure. We are key contributors, conference speakers, and maintainers. Why is this important for our partner success? Because with such deep involvement, we can be our partner's advocates in these communities. We take full responsibility for every single piece of our software. If you are a Virtuoso partner, you can be sure that we can implement changes you need down to the kernel level. And even more, actually, whenever we see that our expertise can bring value to our partners, we are happy to do this just like we did recently when Red Hat announced their CentOS 8 end of life this year, we decided to publish Virtuoso Linux 8. This is a one-to-one -one binary compatible Red Hat Enterprise Linux clone. It is fully free and open source, just like CentOS, and the better version is already available on our website. We've been working with it for 20 years, having it as a base operating system for our products. And we are happy for the opportunity to give back to the community. So if your company is affected by the CentOS 8 end of life, I believe this is good news for you too. Having said this, let me brief you on our product portfolio. Firstly, there is with the Linux, which I already mentioned, with four key features in it. It is fully free and open source. It's available in three flavors, bare metal, containers, and virtual machines. It is, of course, specially tailored to run in virtualized environments. And there will be an easy upgrade path from CentOS. Secondly, we have Virtuoso Hybrid Server which enables service providers to sell traditional hosting, that is, shared hosting and VPS. This is what we've been doing for 20 years with a 35% market share. The product is unique in terms of the density that it provides. It is very cost-effective and thus fits very well service providers' needs. And thirdly, 
the natural evolution of the virtuosa hybrid server is virtuosa hybrid infrastructure, which enables such use cases as private cloud, public cloud, managed Kubernetes, and storage as a service. Now, let's get back to the topic of alternatives to the hyperscalers. If I want to build an alternative cloud offering, how would I do this? There are two options, build your own cloud or resell hyperscalers. Building your own cloud is definitely much more complex, right? It requires big investments, high effort to maintain. It is difficult to scale quickly. However, it does provide flexibility in features and pricing. And what is very important, uh, customer retention through a unique proposition. On the other hand, reselling hyperscalers simplifies things a lot in terms of infrastructure management, support and scalability, but as a drawback, there is not that much flexibility and differentiation. It is difficult to implement uh, hybrid solutions. And to be honest, nothing stops customers from going directly to the hyperscalers. Can we combine the benefits of the two worlds? Yes. This is what Virtuosa is going to address with Virtuosa Hybrid Cloud. On the left, you can see how it works now. We provide software, Virtuosa Hybrid Infrastructure. The rest, physical data center, hardware, cloud management platform, services and ecosystem is handled by our partner, the service provider. What we are going to suggest to our partners is taking over their pain with managing software and optionally managing hardware. Thus, they can concentrate on value-added services, marketing, and customer onboarding. And all this with no competition with Virtuosa. We are not going to sell services to end customers. Our goal is to make things easy for service providers and to help them grow quickly. Imagine you are in a real estate business. You don't want to have to worry about construction. So let us worry about the bricks and mortar so that you can focus on design, marketing and sales. Does it make sense? And this is how the solution looks under the hood. The foundation is our highly optimized KVM-based hypervisor and proprietary software-defined storage. And on top of that, there is an orchestration layer based on OpenStack, providing cloud services such as infrastructure as a service, Kubernetes as a service, load balancer as a service, S3 and others. And on top of that, we have admin panel and self-service UI, while OpenStack API is still available for integrations. And to top it all off, there is cloud management platform. How does it look from an end user point of view? Here is a screenshot of Virtuoso self-service UI. You can see how user-friendly it is. It is very simple and allows a non-technical person to create a virtual machine within several seconds. Earlier today, Liam already mentioned that simplicity is a key benefit of an, of an alternative cloud. And at the same time, it is feature-rich and it fits most customers' needs. Our cloud has all the core features that customers usually expect from the cloud. So, why would you buy a Rolls-Royce to do deliveries when you only need a delivery van? Our value is that we are very flexible and we are ready to co-create the solution together with our partners. So, with Virtuoso Hybrid Cloud, 
you will have a third option to build an alternative cloud offering, combining the benefits of the other two. Thank you very much. Now I think we have some time for questions, and I would like to turn it over to Trisha. Thank you, Anna. As a reminder, it's, it's now time for our Q&A session. So just a quick reminder, if you have a question, simply type it on the question box on your screen. So it looks like we have a few here. So let's get started. First question, do you have a forecast for growth in the cloud infrastructure market? So I think I think I'm assuming that's asking if four five one has a forecast for growth. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, so yes, we do. So the the numbers I shared at the beginning for uh, the infrastructure as a service market, um, you know, that's from our market monitor uh, service, which is you know both market sizing and forecasting of market sizing. So we. You know, we kind of had to go through an interesting exercise for the forecasting portion of our market sizing efforts in the last year, because as I'm, you know, I'm sure you all have been experiencing for a year now, uh, 2020 was a very strange year. Uh, you know, obviously the global pandemic had a massive impact on, uh, you know, markets and on appetites for. Uh, you know, some of these services and, you know, in some cases driving new reliance on public cloud and in some cases sort of, you know, reducing customer demand for services all over the place. Uh, you know, some businesses that would have been buying cloud or, you know, have gone out of gone out of business and other businesses that, you know, were relying a little bit on cloud previously are now relying much more on cloud. <clears throat> so the approach that we took to uh, our sort of forecasting for for everything in 2020 was to look at it in terms of a few sort of scenarios uh, that could play out uh, depending on how quick the recovery from COVID was for those particular markets. So, um, you know, to, to, to put it kind of simply, and, and again, this isn't, this isn't sort of like cloud services overall, right? This is purely for the infrastructure as a service component of cloud. Uh, our prior forecast was kind of a compound annual growth rate of about 12%. And, you know, the the, for, the adjusted forecast based on the scenario analysis ranges from roughly 13% for a very mild uh, mild scenario where the uh, where the recovery is very quick to about 6% uh, CAGR for, you know, the scenario where the infrastructure as a service market is is severely impacted by uh, by COVID. Now, um, from what we've seen so far. Um, you know, I think the reality is landing a lot closer to that mild scenario, so the sort of, you know, double-digit growth rate than to that sort of severely impacted scenario. Uh, so I would say that we're, we're probably uh, landing closer to the sort of, um, uh, you know, 12 or 13% uh, CAGR for infrastructure as a service market going forward. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going on to the next question here. Looks like it's directed to Virtuoso. When is this offering going to be available? Okay, so Trish, I'll, I'll take that one. It's Charles here. Um, we're looking at advancing um, our um, MVP in the end of this quarter, uh, second quarter of this year. We're currently busy with a strategic partner um, uh, that we're going to be going to market with, um, and I'm um, expecting that, yeah, second quarter. So second quarter time frame will be available. Obviously, um, as we work with more and more of our strategic partners, um, we'll, we'll announce plans for, for rolling that out globally. Awesome. Thank you. Looks like we have some more questions here. Let's see. And which geography will this run in? 
So Trish, as I said, initially Europe, but our objective is to be global um, in order to compete with the, well, not that we're competing, but in order to play um, at, a global, at a global level, we'll need to have this in multiple geographies. So initially for the European market, uh, and we're seeing a lot of demand there at the moment. Um, there's some new bodies that have been formed to look at how they grow um, this kind of service in the European market. Thereafter, we'll be looking at the US market, and we already started some discussions there with some strategic partners. And then we'll be moving to the Middle East, more specifically around Indonesia, where we've also started having some conversations with some strategic partners there that own a number of different data centers. So our objective is global, um, and we want to service all of the geographies that we operate in with our traditional products and our virtual as a hybrid infrastructure. Um, and um, yeah, if people are interested, look us up and give us a shot and we'll take it from there. Thanks, Charles. And let's see, next question, does this compete with hyperscale? Huh, that's a that's an interesting one. Um, no, I don't think so. I think that there's space for all of us in the market. What we've looked at over here and what our research shows us is that we're looking at providing core services, what I would call pervasive in the in the market at the moment. So specifically around the services that we're positioning and playing with first and foremost over here, as I stated earlier, we're seeing incredible growth around this, and people are starting to. Um, see that the cloud is starting to come of age and questioning why they're paying what they're paying. Um, and I guess that's where it comes to what we're offering. I think we'll be able to offer this at a more reduced cost than what we're currently paying towards the hyperscalers um, from a, on a pay-as-you-go basis. And then obviously hyperscalers offer reserved instances, we'll offer reserved resources. And if we look at that, which is much of a similar thing, probably land up at about 26% cheaper. So no, I don't think we compete. The hyperscalers have got way more in terms of the likes of additional services, machine learning, AI, um, all, all kinds of analysis services. We're focusing on our core and what we believe the market requires now at, at their core services. Perfect, thank you. Mm -hmm. Moving on to the next question. Um, does virtual so offer pay as you go consumption based on licensing? Is there a large upfront cost to get started? Hmm. So that's exactly why we created this offering. We created this offering so that there is no upfront cost to get going. So our concept is, is that it enables the MSP market to be able to bundle their own services and to be able to get up and running with their customers almost immediately. So yes, we provide pay-as-you-go so, uh, pricing offer, um, and that will be run through the partners that we go to market with. As we said, we will not sell directly to the market. And then reserved resources, which is much the same as reserved instances, but at a resource layer, i.e. CPU, RAM, memory, storage, Thank you. Looks like we have more questions coming along. Let's see, next question. What is your charging scenario for partners slash customers for hybrid solutions where the customer uses its own hardware um, per core CPU and monthly slash yearly, et cetera? Okay, so that that, that question we'd, lo we'd love to answer directly with the person that um, asked it, but yes, we do offer scenarios where, and that was the uh, diagram that Anna showed where you saw that middle solution. And, we're, and, and, and I guess it comes to, before I answer what we do over there, I guess it comes to the flexibility. We're, as, a, as we try to highlight through this, it's really important for us to work with our partners um, to grow the opportunities in the marketplace and co-create together. So yes, most definitely, we will build this out on top of our partners' hardware and I believe that we can accelerate the return of investment on that hardware through our tech software stack and the, the density and the specific technologies that we have um, proprietary in there that allow us to make the most use of that hardware layer. So yes, the answer is yes. And please reach out to us. We would love to have this conversation with you. Love, love, love. 
Perfect. And, and it looks like we have room for one more question here. Um, why would MSPs sell this versus resell hyperscale? More margin? Yeah, so I guess I'm going to take this as well. Thanks for all the questions, everyone. Um, yeah, from our perspective, we believe that it's not just about more margin. It's about the flexibility in terms of working with us. It's about bundling your additional services with it that ultimately will allow you more margin because we're cheaper. So there's an important aspect to understand here. We don't sell directly to the consumer or the end, the end consumer. We sell via a partner or a partner network or one of our strategic partners. So there is no suggested retail price out there. What you decide to sell this out in the market wrap with your services would be what the customer pays. And um, I guess that means that you can add whatever margin you want, creating flexibility and being able to create the offering that you believe your customers require. And can one really attach a price to that if there's a demand from the customer? Maybe, but definitely there's more margin. Yeah, I mean, I, I might add to that, actually, that, you know, selling, uh, I mean, sort of baked into this premise that, that there... I think we lost you. Sorry, did my audio cut out there? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Um, You're back. Baked into the premise that that there's a reason for the alternative to exist is is the is the idea that, and I believe this idea to be true is that you know there's a portion of the market for which what the hyperscalers offer really isn't the best fit, right? And so, reselling the hyperscale is a great business model for people who are selling into the base of users who stand to benefit from using the hyperscale providers. Reselling hyperscalers to people who don't stand to benefit from it necessarily is maybe not as good a business model. So I think it's it's more about identifying who your audience is and and uh, building the right solution for them. Com completely agree, Liam. Oh, perfect. It looks like we have more questions here, but we will follow up with the rest of the questions after the webcast. Our team will gladly um, email with um, support and answers to the rest of the emails, but to the rest of the questions. Um, we just want to conclude the webinar for today. Thank you, Liam. Thank you, Charles. And Thank you, Anna. As a reminder, the on-demand version of this event will be available shortly. And on behalf of Virtuoso and 451 Research, thank you for attending and have a great day.